Hey, welcome back to another episode of e-commerce on tap brought to you by Sourceify and Isba. I'm Nathan Resnick. And I'm Aaron Alpeter. Let's dive in. Today we are dissecting the Ori, which is just a crazy story when it comes to e-commerce. I mean, over the past 10 years, their growth has been insane. They've done it in a profitable manner. You know, their last fundraise was $400 million at a $4 billion valuation, which is just crazy to think about. But before we start diving into Viori and really, you know, picking apart their, their business and how they operate, what current events or trends have you seen in the past week or two, Aaron, that's caught your eye? So have you heard of this uh, Risa Tiza on TikTok? I haven't. No, I'm not familiar. So it, it is a, a kind of a TikTok phenomenon that's going on. It's this uh, very average woman uh, in Georgia who is has 52 10-minute episodes uh, on TikTok where she's kind of talking about her life story and just some of the crazy stuff that happened to her. And it, like literally 10-minute episodes, 10-minute TikToks, She's got 52 of them. And it's like the number one trending thing on TikTok. It's kind of blowing up. And, you know, I'm, I'm interested in what this means from like a moment point of view. Because one, you think about TikTok, you think 30 second videos. Uh, now they've gotten very polished, you know, high entertainment value. But really what this is showing is that one, people actually do crave long form content. Uh, and then two, you know, this is really just somebody who is not a, a professional content. She's just telling her story and you kind of go back and forth between like, wow, you know, her ex-husband was crazy and wow, like, why did she do that sort of thing? I haven't seen this at all. So I'm just curious. Yeah. Are the videos it, paused? It's her talking they're... to a phone. Wow. It's, it's really her talking to a phone. And Is she going to get like a you know, book deal or movie deal, you think? I mean, she probably should. She's got like 1.4 million followers when I, when I checked a couple days ago. And it wow. is really just this thing. And she's just telling her life story about how she uh, ended up marrying somebody during COVID who was a you know, pathological liar and all this deceit and how she stuck with them and shouldn't have. And uh, so it's, it's a really interesting piece because again, this isn't a highly polished thing. This isn't a movie. This is just her literally talking until TikTok times out. And she made 52 of these things. And I think uh, my wife was on like episode 24 yesterday, um, which I didn't wow. want to calculate how much time she had spent put on there, but it was, uh, <laughs> It's an interesting thing for sure. That's it. Yeah. Wow. I, I've never seen kind of long form content on TikTok. So I'm now very curious to check this out after uh, this episode of e-commerce on tap. What, what caught my eye is, is Feastables now, which is Mr. Beast's, you know, chocolate brand growing like crazy, competing directly with Hershey's is only being sold in retail. Um, you know, they started with a, a more hybrid approach, you know, selling both through their website as well as, you know, through major retail partnerships like Walmart. I, I was just kind of curious. I mean, what do you think was that reason to turn off their, you know, online channel and just go directly through retailers? What do you think that kind of decision looked like? You know, honestly, it's, it's kind of surprising because if you, if you think anybody who would be able to build an audience and monetize it, it would be Mr. Beast. Um, maybe there's something else that's coming out and, and maybe they decided that they didn't want to do the, position game. But it, it also could just be simple economics. I mean, it is expensive to ship candy bars D to C and you know, low AOV, low price point, unless someone's willing to buy a case of things, maybe that just the economics don't make sense. And so it's a much better traditional retail piece. And he's still going to promote it, it's still going to do well because of, of the audience that he has. But um, maybe that's why they're driving traffic that way. Yeah, I, I had a feeling it had to do with logistics and maybe, you know, they were having higher defect rates when the product was shipped, you know, whether it be to like hot places like Florida or something like that, where, you know, someone would open it and the bar was melted and they were like, this sucks. So maybe it had to do with that. It's just probably easier to kind of control that process selling through big box retailers. Um, so I don't know. I just thought it was kind of interesting. And then the other thing I thought was kind of done poorly or just not the way that I would have gone about it is Shopify plus had like a pricing update and they basically like increased their pricing across the board, but like they didn't increase it like that much per se. And then they also kind of threw in if okay, if you sign a three year contract, then you can basically keep the same price. And in my mind, Shopify plus kind of has like a bit of a monopoly on the brands that they already have just because like those brands are not going to go back to like Magento or WooCommerce or whatever it may be. And so I just don't understand their pricing strategy. I mean, I'm sure they got some pressure from, 
you know, being a publicly traded company to raise their pricing. But at the end of the day, I just was kind of confused in terms of how they went about it because it didn't seem like they, it just didn't make sense in terms of how they rolled it out. And it was kind of, I think, a bit of a surprise for, for many. Yeah. A, a lot of the brands that I talked to kind of felt like they raised the prices, but they didn't get much more for, for it. There weren't new features or new capabilities that were added. Now, granted, Shopify is always improving the product, but I think, you know, compared to say Amazon, when they increase the price of Prime, they're always really good at listing all the new features that they've added and why it's worth sticking with it. Um, but to your point, I th think that maybe they don't have to do that because people on Shopify aren't really going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, interesting. Well, we've got a big one today for everyone tuning in. Viore, most people have probably heard of this brand just because I think the story is incredible. And a lot of people, you know, talk about the success of Viore and, you know, what it's kind of, where, where, where is it going to go in the future, right? I mean, Lululemon is really the behemoth in the industry. I mean, Under Armour has a, a big portion of it as well in terms of athleisure as a category. But, you know, I think like Viore and their story is just incredible. And so we're diving deep today on Viore. Um, should we start just with who the founder is, you know, kind of the origin and, and roots? Yeah. And, you know, as we're doing research for this episode, I've just gained so much respect for the founder and kind of what he went through. Uh, his name is Joe Kudla, and uh, he's originally from the Seattle area. He went to school at San Diego, uh, University of San Diego, and he's an accountant by training. And when he graduated, he accepted a job with Ernst & Young, and he was supposed to start in the fall. Um, but, you know, kind of graduated in May or June and it was going to start, call it September, October timeframe. Um, but he didn't have a summer job. And so he kind of on a whim got invited to an open casting call for a modeling gig, ended up being hired. And so he he basically went to Milan and was in Europe as a model for that summer and then decided like, hey, this is a really interesting time in my life, really interesting opportunity. So he, he called Ernst & Young and said, hey, I'm actually not going to take that job. I'm going to try this modeling thing for a while. And so um, he modeled for a few years. He decided that it was time to come home and start his actual career. Um, but he, he looks back and he credits his time modeling as really exposing him to the passion and focus of, of you know, designers in the fashion world, the apparel world. That's really what, what got his, his spark going. And he came back, again, no business experience really to speak of and decided to launch a few apparel companies. Um, those failed and, and they were, he felt like he was forced to go back to accounting. So he went back to Ernst & Young this time for real and joined their audit practice for a few years. And then eventually co-founded a consulting company called I think, Beka, um, which they grew to over 100 employees and they were doing kind of financial services consulting. And you know, despite kind of giving up on these failures, um, he had always had this, this apparel bug. And so the consulting route, one of the reasons why he did that was he wanted to try apparel again. And so it gave him the opportunity to pursue this as a side hustle. Um, and so he bootstrapped a few of these passion projects. He had, he had two failed apparel brands that he started before really Viore found success. And I think that's interesting because, you know, most founders, when they fail in an industry one time, they don't go back to that industry and they don't go back again to that industry. So I think it, it shows something about Joe and just his grit and his determination to find success in this category. I mean, I'm not quite sure what it is with his ethos and apparel, but, you know, for someone to go back after two failures to try to kind of start the same business, if you will, is, is really just amazing in terms of having grit and, and being determined to find success in this category because most people would pivot into, into something else, right? And so I think that's like a really unique point about this story of Joe really understanding like, hey, I'm going to figure something out here. I know there's a need and I know, you know, though, like I think his first brand was called Sammy Joe, never scaled and never really, you know, got to the, the scale that he thought it could. He kept going back to this concept and I mean, it, it seems like his unlock for Viore was, was, you know, or his major insight was he got into yoga, right? And so he kind of, you know, had a back injury and then started to go to yoga to try to, you know, rehabilitate that and, and, and work on his flexibility. 
as we all probably need to do. And he started paying attention to the types of clothing that people were wearing in these yoga classes. And to him, it doesn't seem like there was like a go-to brand for yoga yet, especially from a men's standpoint, right? I mean, you had, you know, Lulu, which, which launched at a similar time, but, you know, there wasn't like a brand focused on this type of uh, athleisure segment with, within, you know, men's yoga, if you will. Yeah, you're, you're right. And I think it's interesting you mentioned that one of the things that we admire about Joe is, is the grit and the t- determination he kept. I think there's a little bit of success bias because uh, this whole story hinges on this idea that he didn't give up. And had he not been successful, we would have been like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you, you failed two and a half, three times here. You know, that's just dumb, right? So it, it's really interesting. There's a fine line between, you know, being really deterministic and, and successful versus being dumb. I, I think, it, I don't know, at least in my opinion. As you mentioned, he was going to yoga. He was using uh, kind of Nike, Adidas gear that you would use to go to the gym. And there really wasn't anything that held up for yoga pants or for the things that he was doing. Um, and Lululemon was the behemoth. Uh, they were really focused on, on women and there really wasn't anything for men. And so he had this idea that was kind of sticking with them and wouldn't go away. And so he decided to launch his third brand. And so you, you mentioned Sammy Joe, that was the first brand that was a t-shirt brand, didn't really scale. His second brand was actually Viore. Um, that, was the, that was the name of the company. And it was a t-shirt brand as well. I kind of crashed during the, the the Great Recession, and so he, you know, bought the trademark from his partner and decided to, to keep it kind of put on the shelf to figure out what he was going to do. And so this time, you know, just imagine it's 2012, 2013. He decides that he's going to quit this company that he helped found that's doing pretty well, and he's going to completely commit to this idea around launching the apparel brand. And so in January 20, 20, 2013, he quits his job, um, and he partners with a friend, Chris Miller, who was another person he'd met in, uh, in Southern California. Um, Chris was a pro skateboarder. He built an apparel business in the skateboarding kind of counterculture. And they really wanted to focus on the aesthetics and the surfer vibes of Southern California. And so they, you know, they wanted to go out and raise $2 million. They only raised, you know, 400 or 500 K from friends and family. And so it was kind of disheartening to begin with, because, you know, you know, what it takes to start a business. You kind of need all of that money uh, to do the things that you want to do. And so they had just enough to get started, uh, too much to give back. And so they decided they were going to go do this. And so, you know, it was it was really difficult for them, um, but it forced them to be scrappy. And Nathan, what, what were some of the things that you saw that they were doing to help conserve costs? I mean, in terms of conserving costs, you know, they, they worked out of a garage, though they weren't, you know, uh, Apple. They, they worked out of a garage that was owned by one of their investors. And, and you know, Joe and, and Chris, they didn't take a salary for a long time, right? I mean, um, to, to save money and make some money on the side, you know, Joe would, would go model and, and get some side gigs where, where he could. Um, and, and so I think, you know, they really just kind of grinded it out there, if you will, in terms of, you know, growing from their garage. Um, and they really focused on, 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 on fabrics, you know, though Joe wasn't a necessary fashion guy or designer, he really focused on kind of fabrics first. And so, you know, they, really dove deep on this. So they focused on, you know, the, the makeup of the material and not just the design. Um, they didn't really have any tech packs at the time, but they kept, kept iterating over and over um, with physical samples as, and, and Joe was, was the model for those samples. Um, and what's interesting too, is that their first employee is, is now their CMO, which is awesome just to see, to have that, you know, longevity uh, with your, your team and employees. Um, and they also focused on a single product, shorts, right? And I think the unique insight there was that Joe saw a lot of men that were going to yoga wearing like board shorts to these yoga classes. And so he said, okay, you know, we know men like to wear these type of shorts to their yoga classes. You know, let's start with shorts. Um, and it took a year and a half before they were ready to launch. They ordered $100,000 worth of initial inventory, which you know, that's a big first PO. I mean, nowadays, most brands are spending like, you know, 10 to 30K for initial PO. I mean, placing 100K like first PO is, is, is quite a lot, if you ask me. But they had to order 500 units per color um, of the initial three items 
that they had, uh, and that was the manufacturer's MOQ. So, you know, I think this goes to show because they focus so much on the quality in their fabrics, their MOQ was higher than, than most people. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, they, they took a big kind of gamble from the get-go, placing a $100,000 first PO. I mean, would you be confident placing a hundred k first PO for, for a new brand? I mean, maybe if I had raised the two million, but they had only raised four or five hundred k at that point. So, no, <laughs> you know, it was kind of one of those things where that was probably a really scary thing because it was kind of a bet the company, you know, sort of strategy. Yeah, yeah, and so they launched, you know, mid two thousand and fourteen, which is the same year that Lululemon launched their men's line, which is kind of just an interesting fact there. Um, but, you know, kind of what, what happened when they launched Aaron? Did it just go gangbusters or did they have a slow start? You know, like this thing really looked like it was going to be doomed from the start. You think about this, they're not well funded. They're not well known. They've got other startups in the space. You mentioned Roan, Outdoor Voices, Aloe came along. Uh, you know, Lou Lemon, the, the juggernaut, has launched with essentially your product at the same time. Like It wasn't good, right? And because they were so cash constrained, Joe had initially rejected D 2 C as a channel and decided to focus on retail. And you, you know, his thought for that was that most businesses at that time were raising hundred million dollars and they were spending ninety nine million on Facebook. And he thought that was just dumb. That wasn't a great way to build the business. And so there was also this prevailing thought in the early two thousand tens that you either had to be a pure play D to C company or you were a retail company. You really you, omni channel really wasn't something that was there. If you did both, you kind of had them completely separate. Uh, you didn't do them, you know, all together. They initially, you know, started first by selling in premium gyms. So think Equinox, SoulCycle, Barry's Bootcamp. And, and that's, that's because that's where their customers were. And they quickly realized that men that do yoga don't typically hang out at these gyms afterward and, and try to shop after class. Really, the only thing that they were selling is, is if someone forgot their, their shorts. And so it was, you know, difficult because they weren't really getting the traction, though they believed in the actual product that they had. And Joe was really trying to, to get into major retail chains, but he was constantly being told no. And the buyers really didn't understand what this aesthetic was. It wasn't quite active wear. It wasn't quite lifestyle. And, you know, he'd been told by one, one buyer at a big retailer that, you know, these clothes might sell in Yogaville, California, but they never sell in Manhattan. And they just didn't really see this this need for premium activewear. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's it was a slow start, right? And I think it just goes to show this is Joe's third time trying to start an apparel business, and he's launching, and it's really slow. And I can only imagine, you know, what he was going through, what him and Chris were going through. Um, you know, why didn't they quit? I, I think. They obviously had a lot of doubt-filled nights. You know, Chris mentioned talking to his girlfriend and worried that, you know, they'd have to go get another job or something. And, um, you know, they, they thought, okay, are we, you know, pursuing a hopeless idea here? Um, and here he was, like, in his mid-30s with, you know, two over two failed uh, apparel brands previously and now back at it again. But they didn't quit. You know, I think it really goes to show like perseverance is such a key in this story. Um, and, and I think it was it was pretty amazing kind of how they caught their their first big break. You want to kind of dive into, you know, what their break was and, and, and you know, what that led to in terms of, you know, not only just continuing to try to pursue their retail strategy, but they actually uh, caught, caught a break uh, online as well. Yeah, I think it, it was kind of an attempt out of desperation. So they had pursued this retail strategy and they almost ran out of money. They had four weeks of cash left. And so, again, like you're talking about, uh, Joe's about to three Pete as a failed apparel founder. And, you know, they, they'd only raised, I think, about $2 million at that point. They'd spent most of it trying to get things going. It wasn't really quite taking off. And they decided that they were going to reach out to their existing customers and ask questions about what they thought about the product and, and when they used it and things like that. And what he realized was that his vision of what they were building was actually off base and that the clothes were just as useful, if not more so in all day settings versus just when you're at the gym. And so to Joe's credit, he decided to swallow his pride and spent the rest of their cash reserves on an untested strategy in D2C. And again, it was a, kind of a second bet the company sort of moment. And so he found an advertising agency. They 
uh, began to spend five thousand dollars in ads. They made five thousand dollars in sales. And the next month they would spend seven thousand. They get eight thousand back. And this tested a lot of copies and variations. And you know, as Joe is is kind of seeing that there might be something to D to C here, he's trying to get the messaging and, and the branding and all that sort of stuff to work. He talks. He tells a story about how he uh, one weekend pulls up Photoshop on his couch uh, because again he's doing everything at this point, and he takes all the different colors of their shorts and you know, lays them against the white background. And across the top, he types run, surf, hike, train, travel, chill. It's kind of all the things that the shorts are good for. And decided to put that on Facebook, see where it goes. And almost immediately, they got amazing traction. They were putting $10,000 into ads and getting 20K back or putting 20K in and getting 60 back. And so it was just this amazing little piece here of, of how kind of being humble, asking the right questions and being willing to pivot your business uh, really was a success was the difference between being an ongoing entity and, and shutting down. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty amazing to, to see, number one, to be humble, to be open to other channels, and number two, just to continue to test. And number three, you know, copywriting on your ad can really make a difference, right? I mean, you know, the right strategy with bad copy is going to lead to bad results. And, you know, they had to continue to test their ads to see, okay, what was going to work? And, and they had a big unlock you know, of Joe just testing himself and saying, okay, you know, what ads are going to click here? And I think a lot of people kind of under test, to be honest, especially, you know, at an early stage is they're not testing enough copy, they're not testing enough angles. And I think this was really like Viore's big break because they unlocked a channel, right? And at an early stage, you really only need like one channel to, to be an unlock. And so, you know, they started to gain traction with DDC, which, which was awesome. Did they abandon their retail strategy or and just focus on D2C or, or what happened then? No, not at all. They they needed every dollar imaginable. So they continued to lean into retail. And in fact, and I've seen this with other brands as well, once they had a solid D2C strategy, that actually enabled them to hone their messaging, hone their target demographic faster. And so when they start to uh, approach these these buyers, they have this actual sales data and those no's that they were receiving started to very quickly turn into yeses. And I think their second big break came in 2016 from REI. And I kind of love this story because Joe had connected with someone in marketing at REI from REI at a trade show. Um, you, you know how it is. It's like you, you see these people, you try to send the message in the app or you try to grab somebody to see their badge. Well, he did that. He talked to the person. Um, sounds like they had a meeting. And to thank the person for their time, he gave them a bag of Viore clothes. And, you know, it must have been good enough swag because the marketing person decided to take it home, uh, was wearing it around the office, um, back when people had offices. And the buyer for activewear saw that sweatshirt and said, hey, I really like that. Where do you, where'd you get that? And he said, oh, you know, it's made by this small company called Biore. They're, they're in San Diego. And, uh, you know, the buyer said, hey, can I put you in touch? And so, uh, of course, Joe said, absolutely. And so REI became the brand's first big wholesale partner. Yeah, I mean, talk about timing and, and luck and just, you know, being right place, right time. And and sometimes, you know, you give those kind of gift baskets, of if you will, to people and you don't know where it's going to go. And, and this led to a huge unlock with a major retail partner for them, REI, which became, you know, their first kind of major wholesale uh, retail channel. And I think what was interesting, too, is just how REI tested the rollout. And, and what they did is they brought Viore in as well as other emerging brands that are similar to Viore. And they placed them in a large floor display in 10 of their doors in the largest, you know, metro areas like, you know, New York and LA and, you know, you name it. And Viore, it really tells you, you know, so much about their product because they outperformed every one of the competing brands. And so the next season, Viore grew from 10 doors to 70 at REI, which was huge for them. And by the end of 2017, you know, they really expanded with REI, which I think is such a, just, I mean, amazing channel for them, especially to, you know, put your product head to head with other competing products in a big retail chain like REI and your product wins. I mean, that must have been just so gratifying and exciting for the Viore team at the time. And I, I think too, like very few of these brands are profitable when they're starting and Viore, you know, stayed profitable through this. Let's kind of talk a bit about their timeline, right? Because 
we made a backlog of their history with revenue and profitability and you know funding metrics what, what does that look like so 2014 they launch what, what kind of happens you know during this time and, and and then let's walk through what happens year by year a bit sure yeah it, it's a pretty remarkable timeline when you look at it all in, in one place but 2014 middle of 2014 they launch and that's also the same year that lululemon launched their men's clothing so you you look like you're doomed from the start. In 2015, they're almost dead, right? They're running out of money. 2016, they have about a million dollars in revenue. 2017, uh, 28 million dollars in revenue and they're profitable and they've been profitable ever since. So was that REI? I mean, how do they 28X in a year? I mean, what do you think happened there? I mean, we mentioned they got in, you know, expanded in REI in 2017. So do we think, you know, did that retail channel really fuel a lot of their growth or, or what do you think happened there? It was definitely a good year for them, right? Kudos for their supply chain keeping up. And who knows if they could have had a $35 million year. Um, well, it, it really was the D to C unlock and being able to have that messaging and that positioning that, that resonated. Also, the market was coming in, into fruition and athleisure was starting to become this category. And as a result, the retailers knew how to sell this now. And so it was kind of, you know, you do good work for three or four years beforehand and suddenly things start to open up for you. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So in 2018, what, what happens? Yeah, so 2018, they opened their first retail stores. And I, I like this, that they basically stuck as wholesale first, then went to D2C because they had to, and then decided to do their own retail stores. I mean, it was also the same year they launched their women's line. So they now are competing head-to-head -head with, with Lululemon and some of the other uh, providers. Uh, 2019, they raised $45 million in growth equity uh, from Norwest uh, Venture Partners. And that valued the company around 200 million at that point. Uh, 2020, they had around 100 employees. 2021, they grew to 450 employees. Their revenue tripled, and they had an unsolicited offer to put 400 million dollars uh, into the business from SoftBank, um, which which they took. And in 2023, their revenue is estimated to be around 320 million. Uh, in October of last year, they they announced that they plan to file an IPO uh, as soon as middle of, of 2024. And they're targeting uh, about a thousand employees uh, by the end of this year. And so, just kind of in summary, Viore today has 32 retail stores in the U.S., a single store in London. Uh, they're planning another 20 stores in 2025, and, and they're hoping that their retail business is as big as their D2C business by 2025. Um, and you look at this, and it's been 250 percent year year over year growth since their inception. And they they really kind of focused on controlling their growth and trying not to grow too fast because. I don't know. It's just, it's a remarkable timeline when you look at it. Yeah, it's, it's insane. I mean, I think, I think also too, like raising $400 million in 2021 from SoftBank at a $4 billion valuation. I mean, that kind of goes to show about, you know, the timing of that market in 2021. I mean, that's an insane fundraise, especially for, you know, an apparel brand. Um, and I, I mean, they plan to IPO, this year, but you know, I haven't seen their S one. I, I would be surprised if they actually hit the market this year, just given you know the way the markets are right now. The IPO window isn't 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 super open, but I think in the future they will. And I think hey, you know, it makes a lot of sense for them to continue to open their own retail stores. Um, it seems like a strong strategy for them, and you know, to try to probably segment off some of their D C avenue because ad costs have have definitely gone up. So I think that's kind of what they're feeling, what their strategy is. What did we learn about, you know, where they're sourcing from, where the products are coming from? What, what does that side of their business look like? Yeah, man, do I have a lot to dig into. Um, really, from, from a factory perspective, there really wasn't anything that was super surprising here. So they're sourcing from China, Vietnam, Taiwan. Um, of course, you would expect these to be some very technical fabric. And so uh, there are only a handful of manufacturers that will do that. Um, but 90% of the volume is being brought in through Long Beach or through Seattle. Um, but what was really interesting was their fulfillment strategy. And uh, just to kind of lay out some of the high level things there. So they offer free shipping on orders above $75. Um, their cheapest product, I think, is like 68. So they, they said 75. So that you kind of force people to increase their basket. But 75 is still a, a higher uh, threshold than I would see for other apparel brands. Uh, they do offer free returns. But they make the returns a little bit more friction-filled than maybe you would see with some of their competitors. 
So the returns require you to print off your own label, to drop it off in a mailbox. They don't offer exchanges on their site. Um, and they really just, I, I think that's, that's an intentional decision to uh, maybe have people keep the product, right? You don't necessarily want to be in the business of just shipping your product back and forth between customers' houses. Um, and so I, I placed a, a test order, um, wearing my pants now, they're great. Uh, but what I was surprised is that my test order to the East Coast uh, took about seven days and they shipped it via USPS. And nothing wrong with it taking seven days, nothing wrong with USPS. Uh, but I noticed they shipped it from Los Angeles and that appears to be their only fulfillment center. Uh, maybe they've got a different one for returns or things like that. Uh, but to have a company of this size that is as D2C heavy as they are, to be looking at something where it's a single location potentially, and it is a longer transit time was a bit surprising. Um, they are utilizing UPS supply chain solutions. It's a 3PL. And so, you know, this is one of those offerings that UPS or DHL or FedEx has where in many cases, it's going to be a dedicated facility. Um, but again, it was a little bit odd um, because I would have thought that, you know, if they wanted to keep it inside the UPS family, they may have used uh, Where to Go, which is the fulfillment company that's out there uh, that UPS owns directly. And the fact that they're using UPS solu supply chain solutions and shipping via USPS as opposed to Mail Innovations, which is a UPS product, was was odd to me. And so there was just some interesting things that popped out from a fulfillment point of view. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, I don't think seven days is is acceptable, and especially that they have a pretty you know decent sized retail presence in America. You think they might take like a micro fulfillment strategy as well to be able to fulfill products from the closest you know retail location that they have. I've seen a lot of different brands do that. I think from their return strategy, I mean, returns in apparel can can kill a business, right? So I think it makes sense to try to have some friction there, you know, but but if they are really utilizing UPS's stack, I mean, UPS just bought, was it Happy Returns or Loop Returns? One of the return platforms that, you know, easily connects with your Shopify and you can easily just drop off, you know, the piece of, of clothing at UPS and they'll package it and return it for you. So, you know. Friction on returns, I think, is always going to be in question. I think part of that is to obviously try to you know lower returns, but is that a good strategy? I don't know. I think probably the better strategy is to try to get you know your sizing right right off the bat, so you try to lower returns that way because a lot of people are returning items if you know the size isn't right. But yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that they don't utilize like a you know multi fulfillment type of strategy here, especially, you know, you're on the East Coast and they're shipping from LA, you know, there's got to be ways they could save money there, uh, having multiple fulfillment centers. Um, how, how was the inventory packed? Like when the, the package arrived, I'm curious, what, what did that look like? Yeah, so the product itself is, is great. Uh, it looked like they were taking their retail packaging. So, you know, the, the tags that you would scan and, and things like that, those were on the actual garment themselves. And they put that tagged retail packaging in a e-commerce uh, bag, um, which it was kind of self-contained and I imagine it made it very easy. So you just check and say, here's this SKU, here's the size, uh, you scan it, put it in. And they took that e-commerce bag and put it into a poly mailer. And so it was an interesting thing here where, uh, you know, either they, they want to flex their e-commerce inventory to fulfill what they sell on their stores. And so they intentionally were, were trying to avoid having two sets of inventory. And so that's what they're. And so maybe because e-commerce is so much bigger than retail, they just said, all right, we'll pay for the tags uh, that go into every e-commerce shipment. And then when we ship things to the store to, to restock it, uh, the workers will just unwrap them as opposed to maybe sending them in bulk. And so it was, again, these aren't bad choices. They were just interesting choices um, from what I could tell. And the other part too was just with their shipping label. Um, it was a very generic looking sh shipping label. Um, clearly came off of a, a UPS zebra printer. And I would have thought that, you know, with Viore, the price point kind of where the positioning uh, is kind of an upscale athleisure sort of brand, they would have had a packing list that was um, something much nicer, like Aritzia has a, has a very nice packing slip uh, as an example. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think it's like a nice touch when you have custom, you know, packaging or package slips or whatever it may be. I mean, especially on a higher end product, it makes a lot of sense to do that and, and invest in that. Yeah, I don't know. I think the strategy is, it's interesting, like you said, you know, I don't think it's necessarily bad. It probably has to do with them not wanting to, 
you know, diversify their inventory a lot across their retail presence and D2C channel. I mean, by having one central warehouse, it's a lot easier to manage and, you know, mitigate different, different, uh, you know, increase in order volume or increase in retail volume, wherever it may be. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I, I would have been curious to explore like what shipping from, you know, their stores might've been like and, and what that strategy might've looked like, but you know, who, who knows? I think it's a, it's it's an interesting strategy and, and you know especially at their volume i think it's probably a lot easier to manage you know the way that they have it right now that's for sure yeah i mean when you're growing 250 percent year over year you're allowed to like <laughs> you know cut some corners and think about this but this this to me represented a really clear opportunity that uh you know their e-commerce team their supply chain team could probably make some very simple changes that at least in my opinion would have a more elevated customer experience, um, but at the same time, wouldn't cost that much. Um, and the interesting thing is, is they, yeah. they are spending money on things. They're, they're using Narvar for their returns and their shipment tracking. And, you know, Narvar is an expensive piece of software. It's, you know, kind of the, the enterprise trade that's out there. And so they're, they're not afraid to use that. It's just there were some things, particularly around the, the exchanges. Uh, there's lots of really great tech that's coming out where if someone needs to have an exchange, you make that easier, you give them store credit. Uh, and you basically keep them coming back, so you're not necessarily refunding them, um, but you're you know you're allowing them to to stay in the ecosystem, so to speak. Yeah, and and Narvar has like a custom packaging solution as well, so it doesn't seem like they're using that. Like I know Nar Narvar bought um, Lumi, which was like a custom packaging mm -hmm. you know product that they bought and, and now integrated it into their own custom packaging experience. So I'm kind of surprised that Viore doesn't have more custom packaging as well, because I think with their price point, that can, that could go a long way. But what, what a story. I mean, Viore should have failed. Like, like it's crazy to hear and just dissect everything that happened, you know, with their brand and their growth and how they've managed it all. I mean, what ultimately do you think led to their success? Was it, you know, I mean, obviously grit and determination, but you know, what else? I mean, why do you think Viore made it? I think there's a lot that we can learn from from Joe and from their story in general. The first is that they were extremely focused. So remember, they only did men's initially in a single channel. And they really wanted to get good at one thing before they expanded something else. And you think about this where they opened up their own retail stores. They expanded, you know, again, they had shorts initially was like the product that they had. And they expanded into other men's categories and then eventually added women's. I think there's a tendency with startups, especially when things aren't going well, to start spreading your efforts around and trying to do a lot more uh, in an effort to, to to find something that works. And so, what I what I like about what Viore did is that they they really did their best to stay as focused as possible, still making bets to to try things out. But they when they when they did make a strategy change, they changed the focus. They didn't they didn't split their focus. I think the other thing that's really interesting is that being bootstrapped, even though it was painful for them, uh, really built really good habits around frugality and just doing things the right. Like when you're when you take on too much money too early, it's you know there's this expectation that you have stuff figured out, right? You have to have this unique customer acquisition hook. You have to have some new application of technology. Uh, you have a big celebrity endorsement, things like that. But because they didn't have a whole lot of money, they weren't able to hold a bunch of money in inventory, and so they. They inherently had to invest in their vendor relationships, uh, got them comfortable with what they were doing, uh, with what the, the potential of the business could be, and really, really forged a strong connection. Um, and actually, the, the CEO of, of um, Under Armour has, has said several times that you know, founders, if they create these close relationships with their factories, can treat their factories almost like a bank, right? You can, you can leverage their balance sheet to grow your business. The founder, Joe, had a very frugal lifestyle. He never really took a salary, as you mentioned. And he was able to get a lot of really smart people who were attracted to the mission. He was able to create a culture where people wanted to work, um, where they were willing to take substantially less money than they could get elsewhere. And he probably was able to, to provide strong equity packages and things like that. But it was just this amazing thought of, you know, we're not in this for the money. We're in this for something else. And, oh, by the way, the money came afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the other unique aspect that really enabled them to grow profitably was their cash conversion cycle. It's probably, you know, not something that we 
really have much metrics around, but you know, if you look at their factory base, most of their factories, even from the start, were pretty sizable and seasoned factories. And so, you know, from my perspective, especially, you know, as they started selling through large, you know, wholesale retail partners like REI, you know, they could show to their factories, hey, we've got this PO. We're not able to, you know, pay all of it before shipment. We need terms here. You know, they probably got to a point where they're able to sell a lot of their inventory before they have to pay for it, which is just an amazing position to be in as an e-commerce brand. And so I think it really emphasizes those vendor relationships that they had that helped fuel their growth in a profitable manner. Because I think the biggest challenge that a lot of startup brands have is having to pay for inventory, you know, pretty much in full before they sell it and before they even get it at their warehouse. And so Viori definitely utilized the vendor relationships to make it so they got to a point where they, you know, had a, a really strong and hopefully positive cash conversion cycle where they didn't have to pay for the inventory before it was sold. So that was, you know, definitely a huge unlock for their growth uh, to be able to grow profitably. So, yeah, I mean, I think overall, it's just an incredible story. Nathan, would you have recommended if they were to start today, would you have recommended that they started with a smaller factory or would you recommend that they try to get in with those one, those big ones where they're a really small fish to begin with? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think because they were so bootstrapped, you know, if you can get a factory that can give you payment terms right off the bat, that's incredible. But, you know, we know they spent $100,000, you know, on inventory from the get go. So we know that wasn't the case when they were starting. But it looks like as they grew and as they got, you know, larger POs and as they, you know, expanded, they worked with more and more seasoned factories that, you know, enabled them to have those payment terms, which led to a lot of uh, profitable growth. So I think, you know, from the get go, I think if you can grow with a factory, it always, you know, tightens the relationship and makes you both stronger. But, you know, as you grow and get to scale, and especially if you're getting, you know, a multi seven figure order from REI, you know, if you can go to a, a bigger factory that can give you better payment terms, it's a huge unlock for your business because you don't have to tie up that much cash, right? So, I think it's, you know, it's hard to say, but they definitely, you know, as they grew, became more seasoned with larger factories. But when they were starting, I mean, any factory, you know, is pretty much always going to ask you to to pay for your inventory uh, before it leaves their factory floor. Sure. You know, one of the things that was interesting about Viore as we were doing the research was that they were just so incredibly capital efficient. So they were profitable since 2017. They had only raised about $2.5 million dollars. Um, you know, up until that point. And the 400 million that they raised went to the early investors to basically provide a liquidity event. Uh, what sorts of lessons are there for founders? Yeah, I mean, I think right off the bat, retaining equity as founders, right? I mean, because they were so capital efficient, they didn't have to dilute themselves. I mean, I estimate Joe probably still owns like, I don't know, 40, 50% of Viore at this point, which is which is pretty incredible to think about because most founders, when they get to a unicorn valuation are probably diluted down to like, you know, 10 to 20%, if that. So he's definitely retained a lot more equity. Um, and I think, you know, there's really two keys to capital efficiency. Number one, in terms of their uh, organic customer acquisition, which, you know, really f enabled and, and made them focus on creating a high quality product, you know, really focused on fabrics from the get go, which I think was the right move. Um, and building strong relationships with customers and suppliers, right? I mean, I mean, we mentioned Joe when they were at that pivotal moment in terms of running out of cash with, you know, a month left of cash on their balance sheet, calling customers and saying, hey, what, what did you love about Viori? You know, how can we continue to make our product better? And so I think, you know, having those strong customer relationships really goes hand in hand with, with their growth. Um, and I think number two, you know, not getting too far ahead of yourself from an investment standpoint when it comes to people, right? They stayed pretty lean early on, you know, they, though they definitely scaled up their team during COVID and now continue to hire some amazing people. They stayed, you know, pretty lean. And even if we look at their infrastructure, right, like they don't run their own warehouse, they utilize a 3PL, they use a lot of, you know, third party tools. A lot of people, when they get to scale, they think they need to build their own software and, and build their own warehouse and invest in all these, you know, CapEx expenditures. When at the end of the day, you know, your your main focus as a company should be to build, you know, great products for your customers. And Viori customers are not buying, you know, their warehouse, they're not buying their software, they're buying 
their, you know, athleisure clothing, right? And so I think it really, I think, is an important point to make because so many businesses, when they get to scale, they start investing in CapEx that oftentimes is not going to, you know, provide the return to their customers that they want to provide. So it's not going to grow, you know, their revenue. Um, what, what do you think about, about their IPO? Uh, is it happening this year? Would you buy into it? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, the first question of if it's happening this year, I don't think that they need the money, right? Like they're profitable, they're doing well, they didn't need the 400 million. I would imagine that this would be something where their investors are looking for liquidity. And so, you know, Norwest invested in, was it 2019? Uh, they're probably getting close with their fund to need to have some sort of return and it's it's going to be a good return. And so I, I would almost imagine that that there's a push for the IPO so that they can get a big win under their belt to go raise the next fund or, you know, when you start to see the, the market um, do better for investments. And so, you know, I, I think that they said as early as, as the middle of 2024, I'd probably say it's like the end of 2024, maybe early 2025. Um, but I, I think, you know, I think it'll do well. Um, it, it's kind of funny because the number one uh, kind of suggested Google question when you search for stuff is is Viore owned by Lululemon? And so it's it's highly possible that that you know as a private company they can continue to you know say no to things, but when they become public, if their stock were to dip a little bit and if Lululemon continues to grow, I could see potentially some sort of unsolicited takeover where a company like a Lululemon decides like, hey, yeah, this is a great brand. We think that we should own this ecosystem. Let's just put these together. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean. I, I agree. I don't think they're going to IPO probably till early next year. I don't think the IPO window is really open for for apparel brands right now. But but who knows? Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Um, I don't know if I would I would buy shares. I mean, even in the private market, you know, if someone came to me and said, "Hey, I've got you know a hundred thousand shares of Viore. I want to sell at a you know twenty percent discount to their previous valuation." I, I I don't know. I mean, I think there's still a lot of room to grow. I mean, you look at like Lululemon's market cap. I think it's like fifty or sixty billion. I mean, it's 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 up there. Maybe it's dipped a bit, uh, you know, in this market. But you know, they still have a lot of room to grow. That's for sure. I just you know, it, it's relatively a crowded space. I mean, you look at you know these other brands like Roan or Aloe Yoga. I mean, it's relatively crowded. Um, and I, I think. You know, you really have to be community driven in today's market to win. You know, so many of these brands are investing in community and it's hard because there's, you know, probably a thousand other startup athleisure brands that have started in the past few years. And there's going to be a thousand more in the next few years. Right. So I think it is hard to retain those customers and have, you know, a really strong loyalty. And you've got to continue to innovate and continue to make great products for your customers, which is hard to do over a really long period of time. That's interesting. So do you think like a better exit outcome would be to try to position it for an acquisition? I mean, I don't know, you know, is this a fit for like a big conglomerate that owns a few brands possibly, right? I mean, like, you know, I don't know necessarily what conglomerate they would fit with. Like, I don't think they fit with like a LVMH type of type of conglomerate. And I don't think they fit with like a gap. But, you know, there's probably some holding company out there that like like a Dick Sporting Goods or something that could be interesting. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of interesting angles here from a private acquisition standpoint, but, you know, it seems like their balance sheet is really strong. It seems like they could be well positioned for an IPO. They definitely have, you know, the track record and history to go public. I just don't know if I personally would, would be interested. Uh, and I mean, this is not financial advice by any means, but, you know, I don't know if I would be buying shares at their IPO, just given that I, I think the market, like, their staying power is all about innovating on products and continuing to build a really strong community. Like if someone comes out with a better pair of, you know, pants or a new fabric or whatever it may be, and it's way better than Viore's, you know, pants or shorts or whatever it may be, like I mean, you know, they have to continue to innovate like any company does. But I just think it's it's like hard to retain customers when it's so much about community and so much about you know, working with your vendors, uh, especially at this scale. That, that's so interesting. I, I could definitely see Nike potentially looking to acquire. I mean, they they are really competitive with, well, Nike's competitive with everybody, let's be honest. But, you know, I could see a Nike or an Adidas being interested in, in kind of 
having their their toe on this and really trying to compete more directly with Lululemon, especially now that Lululemon has launched footwear, which is their turf. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I agree with a lot of the sentiment that you have where I think that it's a it's a good business. It's certainly a profitable business. I don't know, you know, if the valuation of four billion is still you know, accurate or if it's going to be ten billion or it really depends on the price. For me, I think that there's there's so much potential there for this business to be improved. And I'm I'm really just basing that off of like, the things that they could be doing on the D2C fulfillment side that, you know, is kind of near and dear to my heart. And so I think that there's probably a, a huge amount of engagement that they could drive from their existing customer base by making some concerted efforts over a six to nine month period in order to really tie those people together. And so, you know, there's there's an opportunity here where if they, if they execute that right, they could actually outflank um, Aloe or Lululemon. Uh, because those companies, while bigger, have more tech debt and, and just more inertia with what's already working, um, where they could tweak this and, and be a little bit more productive. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think this was a great deep dive on Viore. Are there any kind of uh, closing thoughts or remarks you want to leave people with on this episode of e-commerce on tap? You know, the the one thing that kind of stuck with me as as we were preparing for this episode was, you know, how much it comes down to the founder and the founder's mentality. Um, there were so many times where Joe probably wanted to quit, probably looked in the mirror and said, hey, I'm, I'm not very good at this, right? Uh, I, should, I should go do something different. And to his credit, there were times where he, that's exactly what he did. He closed two businesses beforehand. And so I think that a lot of times as founders or aspiring founders, people want to say, oh, I'm gonna hold on. And if I, if I never give up, it's just gonna work out. And that's not always the case. And it's about understanding, um, you know, when to double down, when to when to kind of cut your losses and move into a different direction. And I think what I what I learned most and appreciate about Joe was just his humility um, and willingness to to try things differently and, and to admit that maybe he had gotten it wrong. And he had built a culture, he had built a team of people who had strong opinions, who had expertise, and was willing to listen to them. And I think that was really the difference between uh, you know Viore being a success and Viore being you know, just another defunct athletic company. Totally. I agree. And I think it's amazing that, you know, most founders would steer away from their past failures, but Joe really dove in and said, Hey, I'm going to find success in this apparel category. And, and he did. I mean, this is just an incredible story and I'm excited to see what happens if Yori goes public or gets bought, you know, time will tell. Thank you everyone for tuning in to this episode of e-commerce on tap brought to you by SourceFi and Isba. We appreciate any, you know, likes, comments, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. It helps us and share the episode with a friend. You know, we're always curious to hear what other people think. Thank you again. And I know next episode, we've got a really exciting deep dive. So keep an eye out for that.